This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Dan Lynch and I talk with Tim Bonneman of Open Source Science about that topic and about the Venn overlap that needs to be increased between open source software and hardware and code writing on one hand and open source science development on the other. These are more separate than they ought to be. And he's leading the effort to move those things together. Lots and lots of interesting topics. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 733. Recorded Wednesday, May 24th, 2023. Open source science. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures that if a device isn't secure, it can't access your apps. It's zero trust for Okta. Visit collide.com slash floss and book a demo today. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Good morning, good evening, or good whenever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles, and today I am joined. This is Floss Weekly. I had to say that, and I forgot, but not really because I just remembered it. Anyway, I am joined today by Dan Lynch, and it's early today (laughs) for us. It is, yeah. Hey, Doc, you okay? Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. Seven early, early rise here on the West Coast, but you're, you're, it's evening already for you there. So how are you doing? Uh, not quite. It's afternoon, mid-afternoon. Afternoon. Oh, that's uh, but right. But I have less excuse than you to be sleepy at the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to blame my allergies. I think it's the, uh, there's a lot of pollen around at the moment. That's kind I, of, I, I blame mine too, because, uh, but I'm always allergic to California. It's, uh, mm-hmm. there's something about it, even though I live here and vote here. Um, but you know, it, it happens. So what's that t-shirt? I'm, I'm seeing half a cartoon on your t-shirt. Oh, this is. I don't, do you guys have the Mister Men in America? Roger Hargreaves. It's a kids' characters thing. This is Mister Bump. He's called. He's covered in bandages because he's always having accidents. That's why he's called Mister. <laughs> no, no, I don't. We, we, but I've I haven't watched cartoons since uh, or looked at cartoons since I was a kid, mm-hmm. which was more than a, <laughs> the better part of a century ago. So, are you familiar with um, our guest today in open source science? Uh, um, a little bit, yeah. I've I have done some. Uh, I did a bit of research this afternoon. Um, I did have the advantage of not being crazy early in the morning like you, which is good. <laughs> so I, I had a little read around on uh, OSI, which we're going to talk about, and some of the projects and stuff uh, that that they've been involved in. It's a really exciting area, actually. I think there's a massive yeah. crossover between the science world and and the open source world. So I'm going to hurry up and bring him in because uh, we're off to a late start. Um, I guess is Tim Bonneman. Um, He's uh, the community lead for open source science, uh, OSSCI, a new NumFocus initiative in partnership with IBM. Uh, its aim is to accelerate scientific research and discovery through better open source and science. And there's a lot more to his bio, but it's all these questions we can ask. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hey, good doing? morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good so afternoon. where are you? What, what part of the day is it for you? I'm on Pacific time. I'm based in San Jose, California. Oh, cool. Cool. Well, not that just a, a four hour drive from me at this, this point. I'm in Santa Barbara. So so um, so tell us, uh, fill us in on what open source science is about, uh, what NumFocus is about as well. And is it pronounced that way? Yeah, it's NumFocus. Okay. Yeah. So um, NumFocus is a nonprofit um, and uh, surprisingly few people know about it. It is home to a lot of the uh, most popular Python projects, NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, Panda, Scikit-Learn, et cetera. They have dozens of sponsored um, projects and all, I think also several dozen associated projects that are onboarding. Um, they're in Austin, Texas. And uh, uh, they're small relatively. I think they have like 10 or so employees, several million annual budget. Um, so very small compared to, say, Linux Foundation or others in this space. Um, and open source science 
uh, was launched last year at the at the SciPy conference in Austin. Uh, the idea came out of uh, IBM Research, but it was intentionally set up on neutral ground as a community initiative under NumFocus. Um, a lot of the Python projects are very relevant relevant to the mission of open source science, so it was a good home. Um, and uh, yeah, it's about open source science. It's about uh, accelerating scientific research and discovery by improving any and all aspects of open source and science from, you know, onboarding students and young scientists all the way to, you know, more institutional changes that might encourage uh, better practices in science when it comes to open source. It seems to me because, uh, and I'm wondering, this is, I'm going to project something here, which is that um, having been around open source before we called it that, and it was still free software back in the 80s and 90s, um, uh, the, the default within code writing in general was it, it was all owned, it was all closed, it would all belong to companies. And in a similar way, I think science has been in a similar place, it's always looking to create patents, to create walls, to lock things up, uh, to hold them in a proprietary way. Is is open source science behind open source code writing and publishing in that sense, or is, am I just guessing at that? You mean in terms of development? Yeah. Or in terms of and, and what, maturity? What, yeah, and 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 the mentality about it as well. Like if I, you know, I'm, let's say, I mean, I realize most people doing science are doing it either inside the academy, um, of one in one way or another, or for a company. And those two institutions have different reasons for wanting to hold things to themselves, right? I mean, yes. when I when I started as a fellow at UC Santa Barbara, I had to sign something saying every thought, every invention I had while I was there belonged to them. And uh, but when I did the same thing at Harvard, they did nothing of the sort, but more or less communicated, "We just hope you remember us when you succeed at something." It's a different mentality, but in both cases, the assumption was that the intellectual property, whatever it was, um, belonged to the institution, not to the individual. Um, and the individual was less free to share this stuff. Right. Um, so I'm much wondering what, what, what the institutional flywheels are and, you know, and how those compare. Yeah. I think in academia, um, I mean, people publish research and along with that research, they, they publish artifacts, right. They publish, uh, or they may publish artifacts, let's say. Um, I think there's been an uh, uh, increasing trend towards towards open science in 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 uh, among some in academia, let's say. Um, and so they publish some, uh, uh, research, and along with that, they might publish data sets or models or open source uh, software that they've written for the purpose of completing the the research. And um, those are the people we're trying to to reach, right? And we also want to try to encourage more people to to follow those those practices. In the in the private sector, yes, there is a lot of proprietary um, research. Um, however, there's also uh, with all open source, there are areas where you know the rising tide lifts all boat type of approach, where you have tools that uh, make sense to be shared across competitors, even so, and. And those we're also trying to to reach. So I'd say it's, uh, um, I mean, it's not completely, uh, you know, 100% open source all the time, but there are enough people that are very committed to open source in science and um, are championing open source across mm -hmm. the the whole life cycle of, of research. It, that's um, that's really interesting. Uh, Tim, because that uh, Doc's kind of got the opposite thoughts on it to what I had, which was, and to be fair, Doc's got a lot more experience in academia than I do. I went to a university or college, as you might call them in America, but uh, I did a degree. I didn't like do teaching or anything. Um, but I always thought um, a large part of uh, the scientific community anyway, a lot of it's to do with peer review is a big thing they talk about, peer review. You've got to be able to see and yeah. replicate what the other people are doing. So I would have thought that mindset would fit in really well with open source in a yes. way. Yes. And the people we've been connecting with so far, we're still new, right? We're less than a year old. Um, mm -hmm. The people we're connecting with initially um, are are very invested in open source and are leaders in their respective fields in open source. 
Um, and in fact, uh, when you mentioned reproducibility, we're actually in the process of launching uh, a new interest group on reproducible science uh, in June, um, which will address these challenges, right? When you have research that relies on software and data and models, you know, if it's, it's, it may be very hard to keep it reproducible over time if you don't maintain it, if you don't tend to it. Um, and so we're going to bring people together to work on possible approaches to, you know, come up with better options for keeping science reproducible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it makes a, a lot of sense to me. But as I said, I, I'm no expert in that field, but in that area, I suppose, of academia. Um, it seems as though there's a kind of, to me, it feels like there's a, a close link in the kind of technology as well, because I, I think about things like Scientific Linux, which was, um, it was kind of spun out of Red Hat, I believe, originally, or, or uh, Fedora, or one of those uh, projects, um, which became a really popular thing. I remember reading, I don't know if this is still true, but I'm going to go back now, it's anecdotal evidence, but something like 18 of the 20 fastest craze or supercomputers in the world were running Linux at the time or a Linux kernel, which we always championed, obviously, as Linux people. We were like, hey, we run the stuff that does the heavy research. Is there a big crossover there with the technology suppliers as well? Because um, you've got like, obviously, uh, a lot of the universities are doing, are getting in pro stuff like Red Hat contracts. You've obviously got IBM Red Hat, obviously, together now and so on. Is there a crossover there as well? Um, I believe so. I mean, we haven't um we haven't looked at well i'm i'm pretty sure there is anecdotally um we haven't looked at uh um these um like advanced computing facilities and what they're using um but the the groups that we have which initially is chemistry and uh life sciences and uh, climate um there are in their work as practitioners they're using open source up and down so mm -hmm. yeah uh, it makes a lot it makes a lot of sense to me I, I know a lot of uh things come out of you know like some nasa and stuff like that they use a lot of this kind of stuff they're very into python i believe at nasa i was told that yeah. once i don't know if that's really true i assume they are it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, num focus i'd never heard of them either you, you said not many people have heard of them but of course yeah. i know numpy and i know jupiter i've used jupiter yep. notebook a lot but I never heard of them. Yeah, they're also so, yeah. Th they're also the uh, they're also behind the very uh, excellent PyData uh, mm -hmm. meetup network and PyData conferences. I just went to had a chance to go to Seattle for the PyData Seattle conference, and it's a it's a great community. Uh, I was very impressed. Um, it's a great conference, great content, um, great vibe, and uh, yeah, and they are um, kind of in the background, surprisingly. Uh, but then when you ask people, like, do you know, you know, pandas, do you know Jupiter? Yeah, of course. So, mm -hmm. yeah, oh. it's interesting. Maybe they just don't promote themselves as much. Huh? So maybe, maybe, they're <laughs> maybe they should <laughs> in the background. Maybe they're happy to be, you know, in the background promoting these great projects. Yeah. Um, it's very, very cool. Yeah. Um, uh, now, it, it seems to me that like what you're trying to do is, is bring, obviously, you're trying to bring people together across the science community, development community, open source community. What kind of tools and things do you use to do that? You've, you mentioned uh, interest groups. Uh, yeah. What kind of stuff do you do? You do? Yeah, so our approach is is um, is in a way twofold at the moment. So we, we're we starting out with uh, five interest groups, um, three verticals, which are, you know, chemistry, material science, and life science, healthcare, and climate sustainability. And then we have two groups that cover horizontal themes, uh, one on reproducibility, which is launching in June, and the other is about creating a map of science, which is going to be a tool to discover and explore tools, open source tools in research and the related scientific published papers and the people behind both. Um, so we're bringing together, we have a few dozen people, but growing, mm -hmm. uh, we're bringing together, um, you know, experts, scientists who already are heavily invested in open source, who have successfully applied open source in their, in their field, um, and other stakeholders, some foundations, government, some private industry and get them together, build community, get them to exchange, uh, you know, talk about what they're working on, how they're using open source. Uh, what roadblocks, what challenges they run into, what pain points they experience. And then from there, look at how things could be 
improved basically that's that's kind of the um the idea but it's really a uh an opportunity a venue for people to connect with each other and learn from each other uh and share notes that's that's basically and we we suspect that some good will come out of that right and these mm -hmm. are going to be there's like an official um charter so very soon they're going to have co-chairs uh and it's going to be a bit more you know official and organized but uh it's been it's been fun getting these people together and then the second um approach is more a, a wider lens of building a, a wider community for people interested in open source and science who may not necessarily want to commit to working in a or collaborating in a, in a working group and so we had a first um meetup in february at uc santa cruz we're going to have lots of meetups this summer and fall we're just lining them up and finalizing details in chicago and austin and a bunch of places in europe um and so that's where we're going to try to get people make people aware that this new initiative exists and get them excited about the opportunities we want to connect as part of this initiative, connect scientists with open source developers and, and facilitate that exchange um, for, you know, who knows, upskilling scientists or creating opportunities for open source developers to contribute to projects that are that have a science focus. Um, so those are kind of the two prongs. Uh, and then in the, in the background, I'd say we just went to uh, Open Source Summit in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And we've been very busy trying to connect with the wider ecosystem. There's lots of organizations and communities and, and individuals who already have been working on related efforts there, where there is some overlap or some kind of relation. And we're just trying to, you know, plug into all the right spots and, and find synergy there. Mm. Yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. And I have to ask the kind of, um, I don't know how to put it. it, it's not exactly a dirty question, but you mentioned about funders and stuff I noticed a lot in the documents um, and some of the the, pub, um, the publicity stuff. So I'm assuming it would be hopefully a way for projects and companies who need these projects to say, we need you know X feature or, or this to work better or whatever it is, we'll pay you X amount to do it. Is there a link there possibly as well? Yeah, so... We don't have anything concrete <laughs> lined up yet in terms of yeah. like concrete project, but yes. So a big issue that has come up at pretty much all the, the, the meetings we've held and all the conversations we've had is, you know, funding and, and sustainability for open source. And so there are lots of, you know, challenges and some challenges are maybe even worse than in the private sector. Um, and so, yes. We want to find ways to address that and we're going to talk about in fact there is a there's probably going to be an interest group on just funding and sustainability that will uh form we have a we have kind of an intake form and you know people have been signing up to join uh, the work and uh, they can suggest topics of their own right in addition to the five that we're starting out with and so funding and sustainability is, is a very one of the most commonly mentioned topic. So yes, um, there should be better ways to ensure uh, the right projects are, are, are funded and sustained as needed. So I have some questions lined up here um, sure. to leverage off some of what we've already talked about. But first, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures unsecured devices can't access your apps. Collide has a big news. If you're an Okta user, Collide can get your entire fleet up to 100% compliance. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture device compliance. Think about it. Your identity provider only lets known devices log in to apps, but just because a device is known, it doesn't mean it's in a secure state. In fact, plenty of the devices in your fleet probably shouldn't be trusted. Maybe they're running on an out-of-date OS version, or maybe they've got unencrypted credentials lying around. If a device isn't compliant or isn't running the Collide agent, it can't access the organization's SaaS apps or other resources. 
The device user can't log into your company's cloud apps until they fix the problem on their end. It's that simple. For example, a device will be blocked if an employee doesn't have an up-to-date browser. Using end-user remediation helps drive your fleet to 100% compliance without overwhelming your IT team. Without Collide, IT teams have no way to solve these compliance issues or stop insecure devices from logging in. With Collide, you can set and enforce compliance across your entire fleet, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Collide is unique in that it makes device compliance part of the authentication process. When a user logs in with Okta, Collide alerts them to compliance issues and prevents unsecured devices from logging in. It's security you can feel good about because Collide puts transparency and respect for users at the center of their product. To sum it up, Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss. So, so Tim, yeah, I mean, I just said, maybe you've already said it, but how many people do you have? You talk about people signing up and you have a, an onboarding method. How many you got so far? Can you say? Yeah. 50 in our Slack. Uh, also, you, you mentioned infrastructure earlier. So, uh, we have a Slack for the people that are working in the interest group. So that's about 50, including the NumFocus team and including uh, the two of us at IBM Research that run this on the IBM side. Um, we have a little over 100 on our newsletter. Uh, we have, uh, I think, I want to say 40, 50 lined up right now to join the interest group. So we're starting to... Um, you know, weave them in. We just added like on Monday, we added three new ones to the map of science interest group. And we're going to uh, start letting people in over the next uh, weeks, few weeks and months, basically. Um, the idea, once we're a little bit more organized and once the groups have a bit of an um, initial agenda figured out, like a, like a work plan, um, it's the idea is for it to be open, right? So anyone can basically, you know, attend or listen in, or if they want to contribute, they can, they're welcome to contribute. So it's, it's supposed to be open. We're going to share uh, everything, basically notes, um, you know, um, maybe even recordings on, on our site. So it's, uh, it's supposed to be in the open. It's an open source, you know, community initiative. Um, just need a little bit more time to, you know, get these groups, give them enough structure so they can have a good, good start out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tim, I noticed that um, you sent us some, hopefully sent us some stuff, uh, some topics to mention, and you touched on it there. The, there's the Amsterdam Declaration of Funding Research Software Sustainability, which is being kind of collaborated on at the moment. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? And also, I noticed that it finishes 25th of May, which is tomorrow. So if people want to reply, they better like stop. Well, you can keep listening to this or watching it, but get on it now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you go, can go to our medium. It's uh, open source. That's science. Oh, it's, it's right on the screen there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Amsterdam Declaration is a is a is a is a conversation that we're involved with involved in um, where some of the major funders of research are coming together to figure out how how they can um can yield better open source results through the the way they fund projects right so mm -hmm. example you know i'm a funder and uh, you know i give you 800 million dollars for cancer research and then maybe oh by the way you know all the software that comes out of that grant shouldn't just be open source on paper, you know, has be in some GitHub and be open source, you know, in theory. No, it should live in a, it should be part of an existing project. It should have a community. There should be, uh, you know, you should take good care to make sure it lives beyond the, the duration of the grant, right? It can, it can contribute to the whole ecosystem. Um, anyway, those are kind of the, the strings you might want to attach going forward so that someone who applies for these grants 
from the get-go has to think about, okay, so how I'm going to implement you know, good practices. Maybe I need a community manager. Maybe I need someone who has open source experience and can connect these efforts from the project back into the, and weave them back into the ecosystem, right? So that less of the work that gets done in these projects is wasted by being abandoned once the, the, the grant has ended or the, the research paper has written, has been written or mm. There are many areas in, in, in science where that happens, right? Mm. But by the way, the, the deadline, I guess, is for just this current draft. I think it's an early That's draft right, yeah. version 0.03. I think, it, I think it might get, I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but it might take until that next year until they sign it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should have said that. It's for the current draft. Yeah. It's not like all over, done, <laughs> you know, yeah. finished tomorrow. I'm sure there's much more to do on that. And um, we actually have a question from our chat room, um, which is interesting. Um, I suppose it kind of relates a little bit. Um, we'll see how it goes. This is uh, a Web7012 is the user who says, uh, can you please explain why open source, that's in speech quotes, um, always gets co-opted, owned, and monetized? It says the best things in life are free, so we must support them with every dollar we can. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I, I mean, I can't speak for all of science i mean the, the people mm -hmm. that we're talking to are passionate about advancing whatever field they're in right they're 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 discovering things they're advancing science and they are um they're eager to you know ha not only have the best tools available for them but also to contribute back and and make sure these tools have a you know have a good place to live and um mm -hmm. so i'm not sure if they're into co-opting or monetizing. Um. Hmm. No, no worries. It's a good answer. It's a difficult yeah. question. I, 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 I have some thoughts about that because, um, uh -huh. you know, having followed it for a long time, I think most of it doesn't necessarily get co-opted or monetized. I think, um, I mean, you want open source to be useful and used. It's going to be used by business inevitably. Um, and, uh, Many years ago, when I was working uh, in the UK with uh, BT and JP Ragaswamy was the chief scientist there, we were talking about this and came up with what we call because effects, meaning you make money because of open source. You don't make money with it. You know, you don't sell it, um, but it's laying around and you use it. I mean, uh, we had uh, Tim, uh, I mean, uh, Greg Crow Hartman on last week, one of the alpha maintainers of Linux. And, um, you know, the, you know, he, you know, he works for a company, you know, he works the Linux Foundation now, but he worked for other companies before that. Um, in fact, it was Dan Fry at, uh, at IBM when uh, I talked with him. He said it, even though IBM has been, was at the beginning very supportive of open source as an idea, um, it took them five years before they realized that all the kernel developers, the Linux kernel developers are completely independent. <laughs> and I suspect you're in a similar position there, Tim, as an independent operator, you know, working for IBM and, and helping with this, with this project. Yeah. I mean, the, <clears throat> the, I think the reason IBM research is interested in this is they realize that there is a lot of science left to be done, right? We're facing some very, you know, existential, challenges as a planet, as a humanity, as a species. And we're going to need a lot of science over the next few years and decades to, to address some of these things. And without a strong open source motor, it's just going to take that much longer and it's going to be that much more expensive. Right. So that's kind of, I think the, 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 the interest on, on the one end, on the other, it's also creating opportunities for some of these excellent scientists to connect with the community, which is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to go out there and, uh, and, and be part of these conversations, be part of these, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, movements in specific fields to, to tackle certain challenges together. Um, and so we're with this initiative at NumFocus, which, by the way, NumFocus is also staffing up. They're hiring a program manager, so it's going to be more parity uh, soon. Um, but 
we're creating a venue where not only IBMers, but also other people from other companies or organizations or foundations can, can, can benefit from that kind of community exchange. Yeah. If that answers your question. <laughs> no, it does. I, I, we're also passing notes in the background and so <laughs> forth. Um, I actually have a, a question that may seem a little off the wall. So I'm, but you mentioned standards earlier and you have these mm -hmm. interest groups and um, I am so not built for, I, I don't have a bladder big enough to deal with <laughs> the, the, the wait times there are in developing, um, uh, developing a standard. I've been working on one for like the last four years. Uh, with the IEEE, and but I'm wondering if there's if there's some overlap with with standards working groups or working or leveraging your interest groups over to working groups, which I, I realize they differ with ISO and with IEEE and with with um, uh, IETF. They all have different different approaches, um, but it's a lot of a lot of sitting around and a lot of arguing and a lot of filibustering by people who have vested interests or personalities and other things like that. It's very different than you have a bug. I submit a patch, you know, it goes through what it goes. There's a, there's maintainer, main, committers, maintainers. There's their standard kind of simple standard ways that open source code gets, gets yeah. approved. Every code base is a little different, has different personalities in it, but it's well understood how this stuff works. But, standards bodies man that's 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 a very different animal but you need them so yeah how do you how do you do that yeah i think at this point we're much more interested in the latter in the in in stuff getting done and if people if we can make connections if we can get people to coalesce around let's say a specific um you know uh open source project in let's say or related to material science and we can get people to collaborate and 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 push this particular project forward i think that's that's what will make us happy, right? We haven't really talked about standards that much. Um, I'm sure it'll come up at some point. Um, and then there might be other, um, you know, um, organizations that might want to take over. Are we going to be at a, a IEEE conference in, in Chicago in July? So I can. Oh, you yeah, will. Uh, great. Maybe I can, so, I can find out more. <laughs> but, well, this is the IEEE I'm working with um, on, on this one. Um, but here's, here's what, I feel like we're missing a little bit with some of the IEEE ones that I'm, I know about. And it's not, and I, there's not any criticism on the IEEE at all. It, it's really about the way standards are cooked, right? Where you're not trying to specify tech, you're trying to specify a framework or a methodology where lots and lots of different, say, protocols or code bases could be involved. But you have to attract developers. That's the thing. And um, one of the arguments I've heard a lot is that sounds great, but it's a 50 page thing. I don't even want to look at it. How do I adopt this? And having the voice of a developer in the working group saying, I can use that or I can't use that, or that's not going to, that's a very good bait to put out for developers if you want the standard to actually be adopted would be really helpful. <laughs> so I have, I'm projecting a fantasy here, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm wondering whether or not you know, what you're doing could help facilitate some of that yeah, cross fertilization. I think, I think, um, I think we're probably like a couple of steps earlier in the, in the kind of on the, yeah. mature, <laughs> on the maturity ladder. <laughs> um, but for example, the, um, this very exciting, uh, uh, group that we have on, on, on building this map of open source, um, science, um, is about, so imagine some kind of interface or a web app or something where you can just as a scientist type in your your area of interest it'll give you the um the long tail of open source tools that are likely related to your query it'll also show you the related published research and the people behind both so you should have an instant kind of lay of the land of uh, maybe a hidden network of people and artifacts and you know tools and research that you might connect with. So uh, that should be useful um, in it by itself. Um, we hope that it might encourage people to, um, you know, join existing efforts versus reinventing the wheel. So it could, so it's not quite a standard yet, but if you can get people to coalesce around, um, you know, 
um, existing stuff that they can agree on is useful versus just having 20 or 40, 60 different tools that do basically this, you know, very similar thing. Um, so that could be one step in that, in that direction. So, um, so that's part of the, we're starting to, um, I actually just this week, I'm starting a little kind of mini survey just among a tiny group of people in, at the company I work at to see what open source tools they've been using this past year in their work. And so that's kind of the mini kind of first, very, very unscientific, just to kind of a, get a initial snapshot of, of some team somewhere. Um, and then apply that over time to other more broader audiences and see what they're using and see how they overlap or um, what tools they may see that they haven't heard about that they thought, well, oh, this is really, this is great. Right. So, I mean, finding tools and then knowing what tools are healthy, what tools are, um, you know, active, are being actively maintained, have a good community behind them. All those things I think, uh, could lead over time to, you know, people coalescing around the strongest projects, but also then down the road, maybe standards. I don't know. We'll see. Excellent. It, it's a, it is really um, it's one of those things that we see so much in the in the open source community, and I'm sure it happens uh, in science as well. But people are you know overlapping so rather than finding a tool or a project that might already be working on what they're working on in their area uh we get the reinvention of the wheel that you talked about that kind of thing of like oh, i'll make my own one it'd be really great to kind of get them together uh, around those sorts of things um in the uh, information you sent us you mentioned about some of the overlap you've got with things that um some projects like linux foundation have done like os climate which i have to confess i don't know much about can you tell us anything about that area or, or any of the, the what's going on over? Don't tell not about OS climate. I know you're yeah. not working on that specifically, but what's the kind of crossover there? Yeah. So, um, and by the way, that's the only, I think, person I wanted to meet in Vancouver. I didn't get to meet. So we have to follow up some other time. Oh, right. um, but there are, so Linux Foundation is, of course, huge and they've been around for a long time. And there are definitely a bunch of, um, you know, uh, projects and, or even foundations or um, people that are very relevant to what we're trying to do, right? So we're, we're trying to connect with them all. Um, they have this new, I think relatively new, um, I don't know if it's a, that's a project. I think it's a project. I'm not that firm yet about the nomenclature of Linux Foundation ecosystem, mm -hmm. but OS Climate deals with open source that's a, that addresses climate change or battling climate change. And so, you know, we have an interest group that's starting on climate and sustainability. So uh, the assumption is there's likely going to be some overlap, either, you know, people or topics or work products. So uh, we don't want to re reinvent the wheel either. So if there are existing efforts that we can connect with that we can plug into, that's, we definitely want to find out what we mm -hmm. can do there, right? Um, the other I mentioned is another. Uh, oh yeah, so like for example, there's a, a, I don't know if you've heard of chaos. Uh, hmm. It's a it's about measuring open source projects um, kind of performance and health over time. Uh, very relevant to us at some point, right? As we build out this map to to kind of enhance our view of the land with these data points, right? To see, you know, for example, um, if you're a funder um, of science and specifically of science or research software, wouldn't it be great to see what are the dependencies and what are the projects that need support right now versus next year, right? What are the critical dependencies? Um, and so, so data points that might come from from initiatives like that could be super helpful for what we're trying to accomplish. So yeah, so there's, and there's plenty more out there. Um, there is, uh, we were put in touch on a, with a project that deals with, I think, battery technology and, and battery, I think both hardware and software. Um, and so that might be related to our material science interest group, right? So anyway, yeah, so we're like, we're super busy trying to weave our way into all the right corners of what's already out there. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Um, it, it is a, it's really cool to see all these kind of groups coming together. I was interested in, there's lots of um, open source interest groups. Uh, uh, interest groups, not the, the right term. Again, nomenclature, whatever. Don't, please don't hold me to that. Um, but I was thinking about there's lots of foundations, obviously, out there in the open source world you, you, uh, around development. You've got uh, things like software and public interest, uh, software freedom conservancy. Please don't get angry about me if I forget to mention another one. I'm thinking to people listening. Um, have you got any, have you approached any of those kind of people? Or are you looking at trying to get some of those bodies involved maybe as well? Because they might know projects that could be related or could help each other or, you know, help. Yeah. Uh, yes, we, um, there's, um, um, there are foundations out there. Um, so for example, um, uh, the, I can't confirm any, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. any concrete agreements yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just want to mention there is a, a foundation out there, um, the Sloan foundation. Um, and one of their programs is about creating open source program offices or OSPOs at universities, right? So they, I think they had a, an initial pilot with six universities, including UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I think they're about to launch another six, I think. Uh, and so this is the idea of giving open source a more um, strategic home at a university, right? So have a central you're familiar with the open source program office, I'm assuming. So mm -hmm. it's basically a central hub that can, you know, coordinate and, and drive and measure and advance open source across the entire organization versus each department doing their own thing. Right. So we've been working very closely with the, uh, uh OSPO at us UC Santa Cruz. And, uh, uh, we're very interested in, I guess, kind of piggybacking on these efforts as we can, you know, with an OSPO, it's much easier for us to get a view of the, you know, open source science that's happening at a university, right? So um, there are foundations like that, that both kind of have an interest on, uh, in are working on projects that advance open source at an institutional level in the academic sector, um, but they also um, fund other projects, including um, for example, uh, Jen Zuckerberg Foundation funds uh, individual projects as well. Um, so there is, so we're, yes, we are uh, connecting with uh, organizations like that. So um, I have a couple of questions lined up, but first I have to let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and is trusted by millions. Even our very own Steve Gibson has switched over. With Bitwarden, all of the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. Protect your data and privacy with Bitwarden by adding security to your passwords with strong, randomly generated passwords for each account. Go further with the username generator, create unique usernames for each account, or even use any of the five integrated email alias services. Bitwarden is open source with all the code available on GitHub for anyone to view. This means you don't have to trust their word. You can see that it's completely secure. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed every year. And the results are also published on their website. This is open source security that you can trust. Bitwarden also launched a new Bitwarden Secrets Manager currently in beta. It's an end-to-end -end encrypted solution that allows teams of developers to centrally secure, manage, and deploy sensitive secrets like API keys and machine credentials. Secrets Manager keeps those sensitive developer secrets out of open source code and eliminates the risk of them being exposed to the public. Bitwarden needs developers to help test out the new secrets manager and provide feedback. Learn more at bitwarden.com slash secrets beta. That's the word secrets and beta, bitwarden.com slash secrets beta. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's teams organization option is $3 a month per user, whether enterprise organization plan 
is just $5 a month per user. Individuals can always use the basic free account for an unlimited number of passwords, upgrade any time to a premium account for less than $1 a month, or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. At Twit, we are fans of password managers. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. So you gave us a, a, a handy list of many things to talk about. <laughs> and, and I, and I, I love that because so many say, yeah, I'll just look at the LinkedIn or something else like that. Um, but one of them, and maybe you've touched on it. I missed it because it's busy looking at our back channel or something, but is the, the map of science. I'm a map yeah. guy. So tell us about that. What is the map of science? Where can we see it? What yeah. is, what is, what's the deal there? So you can't see it yet. We, we're getting ready to, um, well, pull in a few more resources and then hopefully start prototyping soon. We definitely want to get something on the, on the web before the end of the year. Um, it's about a, so one of the challenges apparently is that uh, many of these open source efforts are a bit disjointed, right? There's a lot of uh, siloism going on, people working in their little corner of science, um, not even talking to colleagues at a different department or a different company. Um, and it is also hard to track which open source projects have been driving certain types of published research. Um, Jan Zuckerberg Foundation did an awesome project last year where they really uh, analyzed a, a huge pile of medical research and tried to pull out the references to open source projects and normalize them because everybody, there's no standard, <laughs> talk about standards. Um, people you know, link to them, they, they quote them, they have them in the footnotes. Uh, it's all over the place and they reference different versions, different parts of a GitHub repo. It's like, it's a mess, right? So these, um, this team at, uh, CZI applied some, you know, uh, magic to, to kind of clean up those references and normalize them and then do, do some analysis on them. And I can, I can send you the, the link to the medium post after, um, it's really fascinating. So that's another challenge, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to, you can you can probably find it, but it will take you forever to um, to find those linkages, right? And so, what this uh, idea of map of science is about is to to connect those dots, right? So, on the one hand, you have open source projects that are related to science. On the other, you have published research that has referenced any of these open source projects. And then behind both, you have people, right? So, uh, you know, maintainers, contributors of these open source projects, as well as authors of the research. And in some cases, they overlap, right? So, and there's other things. You could also plug in like data sets or, you know, models or funding events and things like that. But for, just to get started, you have open source projects, papers, and people. And so this tool will allow you to search for any given topic and it'll show you a, a, a small map that connects these dots right and hopefully you'll find some people you should probably talk to if you're if you if you're going if you're starting a new research project there should be people that uh, uh and, and communities behind them that are relevant to what you're trying to do um, you might find some research you hadn't uh, seen before. So that's kind of the, the idea. And uh, the hope is that it'll make it more likely for people to build on what's already out there and connect with the, the people already involved in that particular sphere they're entering. And then there's other things that could be done once that's, once that initial kind of those initial use cases have been um, addressed. I think there's other 
uh, there's other use cases for funders, for institutions like university that could make this super interesting for them to, um, you know, to, to see a map of their particular part of the universe. A, a couple of points about that. Um, uh, one is I remember because I was a philosophy major, um, a terrible one, but I was one, um, that uh, it said that philosophers know more and more about uh, less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything. While well, scientists know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. And in the academy, especially, there's a a tendency for everybody to specialize in medicine, for example, in healthcare. And there are so many th topics. There are so many collections of symptoms, for example, one could find in healthcare that can only be seen from a multidisciplinary perspective. So you need that kind of overlap. So I just wanted to bring that up because scientists tend to be specialized. If they're really good at something, they tend to be good at one thing um, or one part of one thing. And um, and uh, uh, yeah, and so somebody in, in the chat says, I think compared to James Burke's knowledge web, I, I, I love mind maps. I'm a mind map freak. Um, the best I've seen is a closed source one from something called the brain. I just advise people to take a look at the brain and see how it runs. And do me a favor, knock it off if you can. I mean, uh, I may be up against patents or something, but it's brilliant. And um, as a way of exploring topics and, and, and seeing what connections are between topics. But in one, you, it is open source, I'm sure, that, and you may be familiar with it, but it's one that I love. And it's from the Linux Foundation. It's, at, uh, it's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation Landscape. Mm -hmm. It's at landscape.cncf.io. Yeah. And the cool thing about it is it has, it's all a bunch of little chiclets, you know, like you see for apps in the front of your phone. But you can search some of them on and off. It shows what's closed source, what's open, and and sort in a number of different ways. But it doesn't have the mapping in a way where that shows how these things connect. So I'm really looking forward to whatever you're doing with that. And if you can um, maybe use something from this thing, something from the brain, something from... There are open source mind maps out there. Yeah, you know, where, the, the Linux one yeah. actually, I think, is open source, right? We so we actually I'm sure it has we, to be. We uh, yeah. we actually uh, talked about that at in Vancouver, and uh, we'll definitely get check it out and see if we can even as like an interim to just get people excited about the this idea, just to just to show some initial insights, right? Um, so yeah, we'll we'll, we'll but, definitely give it a look. I think it's an awesome recruiting tool too. As soon as as soon as you have you know, a, a useful visual, an interactive yeah. visual yeah. of some sort. Um, that would be great. Um, I have a, um, a, uh, my own question about this, uh, because AI is now in every, it, it, when I started three years ago, maybe four years ago, whatever it was on the show, which has been around for a very long time. Um, since way before podcasting was cool. <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, it was all still about, it was all blockchain and then it was all crypto. And now right now it's, um, it's AI. And I'm wondering if anybody in AI science is active in, in, in your work or if you're recruiting there. Yes. So there is a lot of AI happening in science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, just, just high level, there are, you know, there are um, foundation models for materials. There's foundation models for um, biology. There's foundation models for um, climate, right? Planetary sciences. Um, and, uh, and I'm not an expert. I'm just very fascinated by it. Um, there is some work that, of course, you know, companies like IBM are doing that in that space. Um, but the, the, the people we connect with also are using AI in, in their work, right? For, for, we have a bunch of computational chemists in our uh, interest group. Um, and so, yes, it is already, it's already there. And I, mm -hmm. I, I expect it'll only increase in importance and the, the, the speed at which things have been accelerating, especially this last past year, not even a year is just stunning, right? And I think it'll it'll touch everything eventually, and it's already touching this, the sciences very much. Yes. Mm. 
Yeah, it, it's everywhere right now, isn't it? It's it's you've only got to turn the news on and and they're talking about about AIs coming to take over um, at some point. It does seem to be accelerating. Um, one thing I was uh, kind of interested in a little bit, Tim, is you're um, you're from Germany originally, so you're originally European, like myself. I am. Um, although I, I, like I you used to be, <laughs> like we used to be. Yeah. That's, I, I better not comment on that. But, um, <laughs> no, given. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on from that. But um, yeah, uh, I, I was interested in obviously science is very global community and stuff. Do you see? Have you found differences? Obviously, you're now based in the US. Have you found any kind of differences in culture and stuff that affect, um, you know, the way people approach things like development and open source and science and all that kind of stuff between, say, Europe and and North America, maybe? Um, not yet. Um, I look forward. I'm going to be in Europe uh, this summer. And mm -hmm. I look forward to meeting with a bunch of people, both at some very niche conferences. Um, I think there's two conferences uh, related to chemistry that I'll be attending, um, promoting open source science as, a, as an opportunity and as a network. But I'm also going to be at a bunch of more um, like uh, meetups. We're going to co-host a bunch of meetups, and I'm going to be going to uh, conferences that uh, target more of a, the wider open source ecosystem like PyData Amsterdam and, and a bunch of others. Um, and uh, look forward to learning about what the difference may, differences may be um, and the different approaches may be. Um, it's just clear that there is a ton of energy in at least North America and Europe. And we're also uh, currently working on our first um, venture into Africa. We have an opportunity to support an event in Ghana in August that's shaping up to hopefully it's going to come together. It looks very good. Um, yeah. So we're definitely uh, globally minded. We want to, um, you know, connect with uh, people everywhere uh, who are into this. Um, obviously, like many other initiatives, you know, you, you start with a heavy North America and Europe kind of bias, but we work on expanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and speaking of of connecting and getting involved and stuff, um, that works really well. Is what I wanted to ask next is you sent us uh, stuff about how to get involved with with yeah. OSI. So if anyone's watching this, listening to this, and they think, oh, that sounds really cool, I, I want to get involved. What can they do? What should they do? Yeah, I just uh, I actually I just shared this uh, mostly in preparation for this <laughs> for this this uh -huh. uh, episode today. Uh, it's on our medium. Basically, at the very least, uh, we invite you to either follow us on Medium or subscribe to our monthly newsletter, which launched this morning. Went out the first inaugural issue. Went out um, just to stay in the loop, right? So we're gonna have a you know a, a ton of things that are gonna be emerging that could be announced uh over the next few months uh, opportunities to join you know uh, events in person hybrid virtual um and probably soon opportunities to get involved hands-on with uh some of these open source projects that are going to be the focus of of some of our interest groups uh and maybe also with the map right that's going to need um definitely hands-on developer uh, power. Um, so that's at the minimum, but you can also, you can apply to join an interest group if you, if you think that's uh, of interest and we're going to be, we started to follow up with everyone and, and we're going to start to, you know, field them uh, into the right groups. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other um, options on the list. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, you can write. I mean, so we, our medium is open for guest contributions. So if you're, if you're passionate about the intersection of open source and science and whether you're attending a conference or you, you caught an interesting relevant session or you have an opinion on what should be done that isn't done currently we are generally open to give you a platform right um so uh just talk to us uh we want to we want to see that conversation um and uh um we started a um uh just a very basic shared google doc for people to add the events they're attending right so we have a view of because we can't go out to all the events obviously and some are very um very focused to a specific discipline that you know we wouldn't be useful at all at these conferences right mm -hmm. um but um we try to facilitate people in our network 
knowing about these events, if they're both going, maybe meeting up, maybe they can host a meetup on our behalf, things like that. So, um, yeah. So if you're, if you're, if you're going to any of these, the list is on links to, from that post, I think, um, yeah, just uh, get in touch. Excellent. So, yeah. Oops, sorry, Doc. No, I, I, I'm just going to say that, um, uh, I, I see your, your, you run something or co-run something called CMX Connect Silicon Valley, which is, which is described as a local watering hole for community types. And, um, uh, our family had a watering hole called the Shark and Rose on San Pedro Square in downtown San Jose at one point. That was an actual pub. Um, oh, nice. But it is. So is this is this watering hole a what is that exactly? Yeah. So CMX is a uh, it's basically a community for community managers or community mm -hmm. people. Right. It's been around for mm, 10 years almost. I think hmm. they have an annual conference in, in Redwood City. Um, back in person as of last year so it's 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 been great um and they do have chapters so i was uh i got involved in 2019 um when they just launched this uh kind of chapter for the south bay san francisco south bay or peninsula and so we had a bunch of um very cool meetups um graciously hosted at google uh, that were great and then kind of everything shut down like many other groups right during the pandemic and so we've been trying to get it started again so we're working on that uh, we had a meetup in i think january that was super fun and we're working on you know getting it going again it's been a bit slow um but i hear that is not where that's not uncommon that's it's been in some cases really um surprisingly uh hard to get people to turn out again at the same level that was kind of pre-pandemic um, but I also go to the Santa Cruz, uh, so Santa Cruz started a CMX group in January. They've been, they're going strong. They have excellent monthly, uh, brunch meetings. It's been amazing, super amazing people, all like community builders and weavers and gardeners. And it's like super fun. So we're hoping to come up with the same for, for the kind of Mountain View, Palo Alto, San Jose area. Excellent. And you you mentioned um, that that's that is, that is really cool. Uh, you mentioned the, the open um, con, uh, OSI is it was only announced I think late last year or, or towards yeah, the end of July. Yeah. July, sorry, yeah. So it's still relatively new. I mean, it is very new in, in project terms. So I, I'm wondering um, where you hope to be in say a year from now, maybe, and how do you measure that success? How how would you say? Is it possible to put, you know, we want like so many interest groups, we want X amount of members. Do you guys think about that? Yeah. So um, we definitely want to see concrete, tangible uh, uh, outcomes from the interest groups, right? So they're not supposed to be just, well, I guess people getting together and uh, and getting to know each other and connecting is a, I would say, is a value add, right? And 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 good things will come from that. As a community person, I think that is a, that is a um, an investment that is uh, often undervalued, right? Even though it's sometimes hard to make the concrete tie back to uh, you know mm -hmm. dollars and cents, um, but we definitely want to see tangible um, output from these interest groups that can be shown to advance open source and science, right? Mm -hmm. So that could be something relatively simple as a you know, an, uh, like a curated list of like open source 101 learning resources that could be shared with professors who need to teach open source to their students, right? Which shockingly does not always happen and doesn't always uh, consistently exist in academia. It's just expected that young scientists or students are uh, experts in open source at some point, even though it's not part of the, uh, the learning plan, right? So coming up with resources that would make it easier and more likely for these things to be taught at a university it could be something. Um, it could be um, facilitating uh, work on concrete science-related open source projects where you just see an advancement there. Um, it could be the map, right? So we definitely mm -hmm. want to show, um, We are. I think we're going to see um, uh, 
roadmaps or agendas or work plans coming out of these interest groups. And then we want to, you know, execute on those as much as possible. And just in terms of the community, just grow it, right? So less about the number of interest groups, but um, the quality, uh, I think they can, they should definitely grow. There should be more people, um, but it's, that's going to be about the quality and the wider um, community of people um, connected with open source science and connecting us with their existing communities, whether it's a, you know, a, a SciPy or um, Pengeo or other concrete open source project um, that we definitely want to grow. And I think there is a lot of room to grow. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, we actually started late and then went long anyway, which is cool. Um, uh, we close always with two simple questions, um, which are possibly fun. What are your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> um, text editor. I use, I think I use TextMate. TextMate is my mm -hmm. editor. I, I'm not doing much scripting at the moment. I am learning Python, though, I have to say. That is a... I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking if you started <laughs> around Python as a project that you probably came out of that world. Yes. No, um, I, actually, I'm not, I'm not technical. I've been doing community for, uh, for many years, um, but I am diving in now. There's so many cool things that are being um, that, well, just in order to check them out, you just have to have some, and I do have some basic, but it's like, it's time to brush up and, and maybe, um, you know, kick up, kick it up a notch. Um, so I will be more into um, editors <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, there's no right answer with any of that. Um, but uh, I've been wanting to get Guido von Rossum on this show forever. And uh, since he sort of exited the Python vortex, he's been loath to involve himself with that kind of thing. But if anybody wants to light a fire under him, it'd be awesome. Meanwhile, Tim, great having you on the show. I, I thanks for having me. It's uh, it's rare that we've left a number of stones unturned, uh, and you gave us a lot of them to to prep for the show. And uh, we'll get to them next time when we have awesome. you back because it's Sounds obviously good. there's going to be progress here. Thank you so much. Mm, thanks a lot. So Dan, that was good. Yeah, great. Really, really interesting stuff. Great to talk to uh, to Tim and and hear about what uh, what they're doing. Uh, I think it's a great it's a great idea. No, I don't think any of us would 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 complain about the idea of pooling resources to advance you know science and so on, and and uh, and share knowledge and stuff. That's what we're here for. That's kind of what open source is, isn't it? Yeah, it's a uh, it's funny. We could have maybe ask anyway, but um, later, but. Um... I had a friend who ran Science Commons for a while, but I haven't heard about Science Commons in a long time. So I don't know if that's still a thing or not. Um, uh, we can never have enough science, can we? <laughs> it's just no. <laughs> this is this is the human condition. I think it's a great topic. So we're mm. we're pressed for time. So um, uh, give us your plug, man. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, well, people should go to danlynch.org, which is my website, and you can find all that sort of stuff on there. There's some events coming up, uh, Liverpool Make Fest, and there's one, a little more local one called Wirral Make Fest. I'll put stuff on there. Mm. And you can find me on the Fediverse, whatever they call it these days, and Twitter and so on. So did you get danlynch.org like in 1995? Or 96. Yeah. No, I didn't. I got it late. I wanted danlynch.com, but I couldn't get that because apparently <laughs> there's a guy called Dan Lynch who worked with Vince Cerf and some of the others in, in the creation oh, really? of the internet. So <laughs> he kind of got there first and I was really gutted by that. I I, I, I wanted Searles.org, but I got Searles.com. Searles.org mm -hmm. was actually around and I almost bought it, but I just didn't bother. And uh, <laughs> and I, I got that for, I got Searles.com for 75 bucks from the internet, I think it was, or network solutions, whoever it was that had that monopoly at the time. Anyway, uh, all, all these regrets. <laughs> anyway, so thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, everybody. Oh, next week. Who do we have on next week? Oh my gosh. I did not tee that one up. Okay. It's uh, Roman uh, Tizik, T-S-I-S-Y-K. Um, uh, he's with Organic Maps. We talked about maps this week. One kind of map. We'll talk about others, uh, organic maps. That's up next week. So 
Stay tuned for that or come back for that. In the meantime, I'm Doc Searles. This has been Floss Weekly. We'll see you then. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.